Hello everybody and welcome to this GCSE chemistry video about the halogens. That is group 7 in the periodic table, which is this yellow group that I've highlighted on here for my periodic table. That's group 7. And in this video we're going to be looking at the patterns in the different properties of the group 7 elements as we go down the group. We're going to be looking at the reactions that group 7 elements have got with metals and non-metals. And then we're going to finish by taking a look at the displacement reactions. That's the reactions between the group 7 elements and a solution of one of the group 7 elements' salts. First of all, let's take a look at the group 7 elements and what they are. So if you have a look at the periodic table that I've highlighted here, you can see I've highlighted group 7. And you can see that I've written the symbols of five halogens. We've got the symbol F for fluorine, Cl for chlorine, Br for bromine, I for iodine, and At for astatine. And you can see there that all of the names of the halogens end in I-N-E, which is pronounced "-ene". Now these elements in group 7 are all non-metals, which means they belong to the smaller group of elements in the periodic table. If you remember, this red set of stairs here separates the metals from the non-metals, and so all the elements this way are metals, and the elements this way are non-metals, with the exception of hydrogen, which is this element up here that, in terms of its electrons, it belongs in group 1. A really distinctive quality of the group 7 elements is that you don't find them as single atoms. You find them as diatomic molecules. And you've probably come across that word before, where di means two, and atomic is referring to atoms. So there are two atoms in the molecule. And a molecule is defined as two or more atoms chemically bonded together, covalently bonded together. And so what is particular about the halogens is that they go around in twos. So not individually, not more than two, but they go around in twos. So F2 would be fluorine, Cl2 chlorine, Br2 bromine, I2 iodine, and A2, At2 would be astatine. What I should say, though, is by far the most common elements in group 7 to be the subject of an exam question are the three chlorine, bromine and iodine. And so when we are discussing the group 7 elements, we are most likely to be talking about the molecules of the group 7 elements, but not always. So what that means is you need to be careful when talking about atoms or molecules and pick the right one for the right situation. And one last fact about the halogens that's quite an important fact to be aware of is that the halogens are all poisonous. They actually are a range of solid, liquid and gases, but they are, each and every one of them, poisonous. I'd like to start to explore the properties of the different halogens now. And we need to explore the patterns as we go down the group. And the first pattern that we need to look at is a nice easy pattern, and that is the pattern in mass, or more specifically, the relative atomic mass. And as you can see from this little extract of the periodic table I've drawn here, fluorine has got a mass of 19, chlorine is 35.5. Remember that's because chlorine has got two different common isotopes, so 35.5 is an average. Bromine is 80, iodine is 127, and astatine is 210. And so it's nice and easy to see that the relative atomic mass increases as you go down the group. And that's true of all groups, in fact. As you go down the group, the relative atomic mass increases, and that's because the nucleus contains more protons and more neutrons as you go down the group. And those are the things in an atom that have the greatest mass. The second property that you need to be aware of is the melting and the boiling points of the group 7 elements. 
And just as a reminder, the melting point is the temperature where a solid turns into a liquid. It melts. And the boiling point is the temperature where a liquid turns into a gas. It boils. And you don't need to remember any of these numbers for the melting points or the boiling points. So I'll dive straight in with the property. And the pattern for this property is that the melting point and the boiling points increase as you go down the group. And the reason for this increase is that the molecules, and so this symbol means because, means the molecules get larger as you go down the group. So what we mean by that is astatine is the largest, iodine next, bromine is smaller, chlorine is smaller, and fluorine is the smallest. And the size of the molecules impacts on the intermolecular forces. And these are the forces between the molecules. And so because the molecules get larger, the intermolecular forces are therefore stronger. That symbol means therefore. So stronger intermolecular forces, forces between molecules. Now, I said that you don't need to know the melting points and the boiling points, and that is true. But I want to show them to you because it helps explain one extra fact about the group seven elements. And here are the melting points and boiling points of the group seven elements. Minus 220, minus 101, minus 7.2, and then we get to positive numbers 114 and 302. And if we use a simple number line to add these values to it, if we put zero degrees C here, and I'm going to add 20 degrees C on here because 20 degrees C is taken to be room temperature. If I add the melting point of fluorine, minus 220, remember what the melting point means is any temperature below that melting point, and this substance will be a solid, any temperature above that melting point, it will be a liquid until it reaches its boiling point, which is minus 188. And after that, it will become a gas. And so this is why at room temperature, fluorine is a gas. And if I use that same number line for chlorine, the melting point of chlorine is minus 101. That's its melting point. The boiling point of chlorine is minus 35. And so at temperatures below minus 101, chlorine will be a solid. Temperatures above that, it will become a liquid until we get to minus 35 degrees C, in which case it will become a gas. And that's why chlorine at room temperature is also a gas. So if we move on to bromine, we can just squeeze bromine's melting point on here at minus 7.2. And then we can add its boiling point at 58.8 degrees C. And so we can see that bromine will be a solid below its melting point, a liquid above its melting point, and a gas above its boiling point. And because room temperature, 20, falls between the melting point and the boiling point, bromine is a liquid at room temperature. And I'm going to finish by taking a look at iodine. Iodine's melting point is 114 degrees C, and its boiling point is 184 degrees C. And so below 114 degrees C, iodine is a solid, and room temperature is definitely below 114 degrees C. So 20 degrees C is not hot enough to melt it into a liquid, and it's certainly not hot enough to boil it into a gas. And so iodine is a solid at room temperature. And since we know that patterns as you go down the group follow on from each other, we can also predict that astatine will be a solid at room temperature as well. And that's in fact the case. And if we look more carefully at the melting points, we can see that it will not be hot enough to melt astatine. 302 degrees C is the temperature we need to reach to melt the astatine. And like I say, whilst you don't need to memorize these melting or boiling points, they do help you understand why fluorine and chlorine are gases at room temperature. Fluorine is actually a yellow gas. Chlorine is a green gas, quite dense. It was used in the First World War to um, gas 
enemies in the trenches because it's sunk down into the trenches because it's very dense. Bromine is one of only two liquids at room temperature. Mercury is the other. It's a sort of red-brown liquid and it turns quite easily into an orange vapour, which is poisonous. And iodine is a dark grey solid, but it turns into a red vapour quite easily. Moving on to take a look at the reactivity of the halogens, so looking more at the chemical properties, we can see, as you would expect, all the group 7 elements react in similar ways. And you'd expect that because that is why they are in the same group together. And the reason they have these similar properties is that they all have seven electrons in their outer shell, or energy level. They don't all behave in exactly the same way. There is a pattern to the reactivity where fluorine is the most reactive and astatine is the least reactive of these five that we have got in the periodic table here. And so what we can see is that reactivity decreases down the group. And so the most reactive are at the top and the least at the bottom. And you need to be able to predict reactivity of elements that you've never even heard of. So to illustrate this, I've mentioned the first five elements in group seven. And so we've been looking at the first five elements in group seven. There is actually a sixth element and it's called tenosine. And I've not said anything about tenosine at all, but we can make some predictions. For instance, we can predict it will be less reactive even than astatine, because the pattern is a decrease as we go down the group. We can predict that it will have a greater relative atomic mass than astatine, because it will have more protons and neutrons. And we can also predict it will have a higher melting point and a boiling point than astatine, because that's the pattern as we go down the group. And so it will very definitely be a solid at room temperature. Moving back to reactivity, I want to explain why those elements react in the pattern that we've just discussed. And to do that, I want to look at a specific example. I want to look at how these group seven elements react in the presence of metals. Let's take a look at the element fluorine. So that's the top of group seven reacting with the element lithium. Now fluorine has got the atomic number of nine, which means we need to put nine crosses in. Two can fit in the first shell, then it is full. And so that means we've got seven more to put in. Lithium has got an atomic number of three, which means we only have three electrons to put in. Two go into the first shell and then that's full and one goes into the outer shell. So the electron configuration for fluorine is two comma seven and for lithium it is 2,3. Now in order to become stable, all elements want to be like the noble gases, and that means they need a full outer shell of electrons. And to do that, quite simply, the alkali metal lithium gives away its outer shell electron to fluorine. And having done that, the fluorine now has eight electrons in its outer shell, so its electron arrangement is 2,8, and the electron structure for lithium is now just a two. And so the fluorine, which has got nine protons and nine electrons, which are positive and negative, then finishes with nine positive protons and 10 negative electrons. So overall, it becomes a one minus ion. And we show that in the dot and cross diagram by putting square brackets around it and a negative superscript up in the air. And this is the case for all of the halogens. All of the halogens form one minus ions. So the halides are F minus, Cl minus, Br minus, etc. Lithium has three positive protons and three negative electrons at the beginning, so they cancel each other out. And at the end, it's got three positive protons, but only two negative electrons. So it finishes being positively charged as an ion. And we show that around its electronic structure as well. And in fact, we don't really need to show the outer shell electron for lithium anymore because it's not occupied. And so just showing that single occupied shell with two electrons in there is good. And this now is 
an ionic compound and it's got the name lithium fluoride because once we have fluorine as the element losing an electron it becomes the fluoride ion and so the negative fluoride ion is attracted to the positive lithium ion with electrostatic attractions and they are very very strong and that is why ionic compounds have got a high melting point and a high boiling point because these ionic bonds are very very strong and hard to break and so the electron transfers just to sum this all up the electron transfers between the metal and the halogen and that's the same whether the lithium is reacting with fluorine or it's reacting with chlorine if we start to compare the halogens the most striking thing that we notice is that as we go down the group the elements get more electrons around their nucleus and if you think about how these elements are reacting what is happening is the positive nucleus which is at the center of this fluorine atom is attracting the electron from the lithium and so the separation the gap between the nucleus and the outer shell is all important because that is where the nucleus needs to put the electron that it is gaining and so since fluorine is the smallest atom in terms of the gap between its nucleus and the outer shell that's why fluorine is the greatest reactivity there is a stronger attraction between the fluorine's nucleus and the electrons that it is trying to gain whereas if we look at chlorine the outer shell is further away from the nucleus and so the positive pull of the nucleus is not so strongly felt and so it is less able to gain additional electrons not only that there are shells in the way which block the pull of the nucleus and this is called shielding so chlorine has got two shells shielding the nucleus's pull from the outer electron whereas fluorine only has one and so the reason for this trend then is that the reactivity decreases down the group because the distance between the nucleus and the outer electron shell increases and this has the effect of making the attraction from the nucleus the positive attraction from the nucleus pulling the electrons in and so overall electrons are gained less easily and so if we were to compare fluorine and chlorine and make predictions about bromine I won't bother drawing all of the electrons in bromine but I've just drawn a circle to represent the bromine and I'll put a plus in the center to represent the nucleus and what we can see just from this simple representation is that the distance between the nucleus and the outer electron shell is greater still than chlorine and so we would expect it to gain electrons less easily because its attraction for pulling electrons in is not so great and so it would be less reactive and that pattern would continue beyond bromine to iodine and astatine as well moving on to take a look at how the halogens react with other non-metals remember since the halogens are non-metals they will bond covalently and remember that a covalent bond is a shared pair of electrons it's not one electron it's two where most commonly one of those electrons will come from each of the elements making up the molecule now when you represent covalent bonding you can do it with the dot and cross diagrams showing full circles like I did for the ionic bonding so I'll do one of those what's nice about covalent bonding is you only ever show the outer shell electrons and so if we have here this small atom here as hydrogen it has got one of its own electrons we put those electrons I'll do a dot for hydrogen we put those electrons in the little shell that belongs to the hydrogen and if this was something like chlorine chlorine's in group seven so it's got seven electrons in its outer shell and so this is one molecule of hydrogen chloride HCl so all the halogens when they form compounds 
they take a different ending. So chloride on here. So this is hydrogen chloride. Even though it's not actually an ion, it's not only when the halogens are ions that their names become ide, it's when they form compounds as well. Now, it's a bit cumbersome drawing those circles, and it's hard to draw neat circles. So an alternative way of drawing the exact same thing, showing the dots and crosses still, is by writing chlorine and putting the crosses in a neat sort of circle where we imagine that the circle is there. So those are the seven crosses that were in the circle, and then we add the hydrogen to it, and hydrogen's dot goes here. So it's not exactly the same, because the dot and the cross are normally drawn in a line like that, rather than, as we've got here, in a line stretched out between the atoms. Now the good thing about covalent bonding is, because chlorine is in group 7 and it bonds in this way with hydrogen, we know that fluorine, that's also in group 7, so it would have 7 crosses, would also bond in the exact same way with hydrogen, and so that's hydrogen fluoride. Now we don't always show dot and cross diagrams, sometimes we are really speedy and we show the fluorine joined to the hydrogen like that, with just showing a stick for the covalent bond, because that's what this shared pair of electrons is. This is the covalent bond. And like I say, the covalent bond is a shared pair of electrons. It is important though, when we are showing dot and cross diagrams, to show these other electrons, these lone pairs of electrons that aren't involved in bonding, but they are important because remember, all elements past hydrogen and helium, they need to have eight electrons in their outer shell. And so if we don't show those other ones, then we won't be producing a stable compound. I'll just finish by doing one more. Let's do tetrachloromethane. Sounds really complicated, but it's four chlorines around one carbon. Now carbon is in group four, so it's got four electrons in its outer shell. Chlorine is in group seven, so it's got seven, but it needs one more from carbon. So it forms a single bond to the carbon like this. And so you can see now that the carbon atom now has all of the eight electrons it needs. But chlorine doesn't. Chlorine has only got two. So it has got six more around here, because remember that chlorine had seven electrons at the start, and so it's going to have one extra now because it's sharing one in a pair with carbon, and that's what the covalent bond is. So the carbon in the centre has got four covalent bonds. That's always the case with carbon. It needs four bonds. Halogens only need one. And if we were drawing this as a stick diagram instead of a dot and cross diagram, we'd draw it like that. We're going to finish off this video by taking a look at the displacement reactions that the halogens undergo. Now, displacement reactions generally are when a more reactive element takes the place of a less reactive element in a compound. So the word displace is where you replace one thing with another, one thing takes the place of another. And in chemistry, it is where a more reactive element takes the place of a less reactive element. And so if we take a look at one example of this, if we have an aqueous solution of a halide salt, for instance, potassium iodide, AQ for aqueous, remember, that means it's dissolved in water, and then we have a halogen, for instance, chlorine water, if we were to pour the halogen into the aqueous solution, we might see a colour change. The aqueous solutions are all colourless. And so any colour change will be from colourless to yellow or orange or even brown. And so if we took the pipette out of the chlorine water and we added a few drops of chlorine to the aqueous potassium iodide, we would on this occasion see a colour change and it would go a yellowy brown colour in the bottom of this test tube. And the more chlorine we added, the more brown it would go until it couldn't get any more brown. And the conclusion that we can make here is that chlorine is more reactive than iodine. And we knew that from a previous page. 
but this is an experiment that proves it. And this is a proof that because chlorine was able to displace iodine from its salts, it must be more reactive. And a chemical equation for this in words would be chlorine plus, now I've not got much room here, so I'm going to write potassium iodide over two lines because it's far better to do that than to spill my products over onto the left hand side and they turn into the element iodine by itself and potassium chloride. Chloride, remember. And if we just keep track of the colours, the chlorine is probably going to be a very pale yellow colour but the more dilute it is, the more colourless it will look. The potassium iodide and the potassium chloride will both be colourless and the iodine will be a brown colour. And that will be our main observation in this experiment. And if we scaled this chemical reaction up and instead of just doing one halogen reacting with one aqueous solution of a halide ion, we reacted three halogens with three different solutions, we can see the pattern in reactivity far more clearly by looking at which halogen will displace another. And you can do this in little spotting trays, dimple trays, but I've got my pictures set up to do this in test tubes. And so if at the beginning we took the element iodine dissolved in water, so iodine water, and we added some iodine to the potassium chloride solution, and then we added some iodine to the potassium bromide solution, and then we added iodine to the potassium iodide solution, nothing would happen in any of those cases. Now, iodine itself is a dark brown liquid. When you put it into these, you will see the colour spreading out a little bit, and so you might think the colour is changing, because remember, each of these is colourless, but what we're doing is effectively adding something that is quite strongly brown to something that has no colour. And so the colour is just going to spread out into this container. So there is definitely, for iodine, no visible change. And so that is acceptable as a phrase in chemistry. No visible change. Much better than saying nothing happens. And so because there is no visible change, our conclusion is that iodine is not reactive enough to displace potassium from a solution of its halide ion or reactive enough to displace bromine from the potassium bromide. You wouldn't really expect anything to happen when iodine is competing with iodine because they have the same reactivity. If we moved on to add bromine to the same sets of three but different batches, so fresh tubes of these three aqueous solutions, we would expect nothing to happen when the bromine was added to potassium chloride. We'd expect nothing to happen when the bromine is added to potassium iodide, but we would expect a change when the bromine is added to potassium iodide. We would expect a dark brown solution to form. And so because we had one reaction for the bromine, our conclusion is that bromine is more reactive than iodine. If we move on to do one last addition and we take some chlorine water and we add chlorine water to each of these three tubes, fresh batches of them again, we would expect to see nothing happening when chlorine was added to potassium chloride. We would expect to see a reaction when the chlorine is added to the potassium bromide and when the chlorine is added to the potassium iodide. We would see a dark brown solution forming for the potassium iodide and we would see a very faint yellowy-orange sort of forming for the bromine. So we would see a yellow solution forming for the potassium bromide. And our conclusion here is that chlorine is more reactive than bromine and iodine. And since we already knew that bromine is more reactive than iodine, we have therefore proven that chlorine has a greater reactivity than bromine, which has a greater reactivity than iodine. And that's what these results prove. 
We'll finish off this video by just having a look at some of the chemical equations for these displacement reactions. So if you want to have a go at these yourself, you could pause it now and see if you could work out what would happen, if anything. If not, I will just have a go at them in front of you now. We take each of these five in turn. Our main thought process is, will anything happen? And so we need to look at the elements involved in group seven. So chlorine is trying to displace iodine. And our thought process that we need to know is that chlorine is more reactive than iodine. And so something is going to happen. And so what's going to happen is iodine is going to get kicked out by the chlorine. And so we're going to end up with iodine by itself and potassium chloride will be formed. Bromine in the second one. Is bromine more reactive than astatine? Now I've thrown astatine in there. We've not looked at it ourselves, but we know that the pattern of reactivity decreases down group seven and astatine is below bromine. And so therefore something will happen. The bromine will kick out the astatine. And so we'll end up with the astatine by itself. Notice it's ending changes to ene rather than the i that it was before. And the bromine will take its place with the potassium. And so we will make potassium bromide. Moving on to the third one, chlorine reacting with bromide. Chlorine is more reactive than bromine. And so the bromine will be kicked out. It will be displaced. And so we're going to end up with bromine by itself and this time sodium chloride. Pay attention to the aqueous halide solution. On this occasion, I chose to use sodium bromide. Makes literally no difference to the reactivity process. It just makes a difference to the naming, of course. We have sodium bromide, so we're going to have sodium chloride at the end. On to the fourth one. Iodine is trying to displace chlorine in the form of sodium chloride. Now, this one will not happen because chlorine is more reactive than iodine. So no further reaction will happen, and that equation symbol, the arrow, needn't be there. Astatine, in the final one, trying to displace chlorine. Well, there's no hope of that. Astatine is definitely less reactive than chlorine, so nothing is going to happen there either. If we return back to the three equations where something did happen, and we use symbols this time. These symbol equations aren't too bad. Chlorine is diatomic, remember, and so is iodine. So whenever the halogens are by themselves as elements, they're going to be the diatomic. The nice thing about potassium iodide and potassium chloride and all of the group one halides is that there's one of each. And that's because the group one metal is one plus and the halide is one minus. So potassium iodide is Ki. When it comes to balancing these then, we don't need to put complicated multipliers in. We've got two chlorine atoms in the reactants, but we only have one in the products. And so we need the multiplier two to go in there. And that solves our chlorine problem. It causes a potassium problem, but the good news is we had an iodine problem anyway, and we solve both of those problems by putting in a multiplier over here, because we've got two iodine in the products. We only have one in the reactants, so a two there solves that problem as well. And that is the equation balance. Moving on to the second one, bromine diatomic will be Br2. Potassium astatide, we don't know much about astatine except it's in group seven, just like all of the other halogens. So that will be KAT. Astatine, the element, we know it will be diatomic, AT little two. And potassium bromide will be KBr, one to one, remember, for the group one halides. And the good news here is the balancing will be exactly the same. We'll need a two there and we'll need a two there. Not only are the numbers always twos, there's a nice pattern as well because the two goes in front of the halide solution in all those cases, whether it's potassium or sodium, it always goes in front of them. Moving on to the final one, last of all, chlorine is Cl2. Sodium bromide will be Na for sodium and Br for bromide, one to one, remember. Bromine is Br2, diatomic, and the sodium chloride will probably be the formula you know best on this page, NaCl. And so to balance them, we need those twos in front of the solution of the aqueous. Okay, that's the end of this video about the halogens. We'll be back again soon with another video about the periodic table. We'll be doing the noble gases next. 
See you next time. Bye-bye.